Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm, agile welcome to Mr. Kyle Maynard. It's hard to take the stage when you feel like a fraud. My message is supposed to be a simple one. Make no excuses. I'm going to tell you that there have been times in my life where I haven't always lived by that. When I started speaking, it was 2005, I remember one night in particular after I just put down a room service meal. I'd been traveling through about 60 cities in 90 days, three months into a book tour. I put down this the room service meal, topped it off with a milkshake. I'd put on about 30 pounds in three months. I was finished a on-demand movie on the hotel movie channel. It was like I had watched four times in a row, and I tried to call my friends up to uh, get somebody to go and talk to, because I was sitting in this room, and I was all alone. No one was there to talk to me. Everyone was out having fun. I looked in the mirror, and I saw the guy staring back at me barely resembled that athlete that I was supposed to be speaking about. And I felt like, for the first time in my life, I had been a complete fraud every word that I would say and speak to this group in the morning coming out of my mouth was not something I was living myself. Now, have you ever felt like a fraud? You may have been in, in the health world representing, you know, agile to go and say, like, I don't know if I can get my own health together. You know, maybe you're trying to go and deliver a message of hope and prosperity and wealth to someone else and give them a chance. And it's like, I can't get this together in my own life. We go through these things and we allow this mentality to be able to, just to become our reality. To me, it didn't start out that way. You know, I, I got to go and release my book and did Oprah, Larry King, HBO Real Sports, all these programs and my life was on fire book became a New York Times bestseller, was speaking around the world, and it was an amazing time. But the thing that I allowed to happen to me was to buy in to other people's belief on what I was capable of doing. Not my belief, other people. You have to decide. When I would travel in the airports, and sometimes I'd pull up to the gate in the plane, and I'd see other people, you know, when they, they'd look at me, the gate agents to go and board the flight, they would uh, think, like, it's going to take a while to get this guy on the plane. I'd go and tell them, like, no, it's no problem, I'll, I'll get to my own seat. And sometimes people try to, like, force help on me, and I get in that stubborn mentality, like, if somebody's going to help me, that, uh, you know, I'll just go and do it myself. There's one time in particular where I had a guy come up to me. I was in the middle of this book tour, traveling from New York and LaGuardia Airport, travel, flying to Toronto for another speech. This guy came up to go and help me down the jetway in the, um, to take my wheelchair and push it down the, the jetway to get to the plane. And he said that he had to help me. So I was like, all right, no, nah, I'm going to go and do it on my own. But the guy kept persisting, so I figured, all right, I'm going to let him help me. You guys can't see my wheelchair. It's backstage, but it's about three feet off the ground. Problem was with this whole situation was the guy that wanted to help me was about like seven feet tall. I had to go and bend all the way over to go and grab the handlebars of the chair to go and, and push me down this jetway. So he goes and he takes about like three steps and he trips over a bar in the back of the chair. And I've got a 60 pound bag of clothes around my neck and doesn't just let go of the wheelchair, trips and sends me flying down this thing. 
started steaming down. There's a couple down at the bottom looking up to me like, this is it, Kyle's coming. And I tried to stop myself, tried to go and grab the chair and ram it into the wall, didn't stop then, tried to go and grab hold of the side of the wall that still flying down to go and stop myself. And there's folding patterns down uh, metal, like, strips that I tried to go grab hold of, rip my arm open, so there's a streak of blood coming down now. I hit the bottom of the ramp, I flipped out, chair flipped over, everybody came running out thinking I was going to sue the airline. I popped up, <laughs> guy came running down thinking he's going to lose his job. I told them, look, I'm not going to sue anybody, just promise me one thing, you will never help me again. <laughs> this way, right. To me, it's, I have to go and, and remember that when other people see me for that first time, they might have 10,000 things going through their head as to what life would be like in my situation. You know, and it's their perceptions of things, the way that they see me and see life in my shoes. You might be wondering things like, Anything from how would I eat, drive, type on a computer. I mean, for me, things are pretty normal. There's not that many adaptations that I have in my life. It's, I type about 50 words a minute on a normal keyboard without any adaptation, even though I don't like people knowing I can answer email right away. I drive a normal vehicle. I've got lifted up pedals. And uh, the pedals are just extensions on there. That It's a Durango that put the seat a little bit closer to the wheel and freak people out when I come through the drive through sometimes. <laughs> and it's, things are pretty normal. My townhouse is three stories and my bedroom's on the top floor. When other people look at me though, they might think and wonder what life would be like in my shoes. And that's something that, you know, if they don't know me, they don't know my story, it's not my job to forcefully show them. You know, it's, it's my job just to, to change their perceptions through what I can do. Other people, when they look at you, they might doubt. They might lack belief. They might go and take their lack of belief and they might put it on you to say that if I were in your shoes, I couldn't do it. People hold perceptions of things about what certain things mean. When they see me, they might see a guy without arms and legs, and they might think that that's the worst thing that ever happened to me. To me, that's the greatest gift I've ever been given. It, and it truly is a choice. The things that happen to us in our lives, sometimes they're out of our control. You know, for me, my attitude going in and, and, and speaking at that time when I was ready to go and give up and quit, like that was something that was absolutely within my control. I was making excuses. I was making all these reasons up in my head as to why I couldn't do it. And I can tell you, I mean, it's not rocket science, but the depressed motivational speaker doesn't work very well. Not a so dynamic I recommend but it was something that I could not control the way that I was born. I was born without my arms and legs. And my parents, when I was growing up, they treated me as completely normal. They did not focus on the things that were wrong. They focused on all the things that were good and right in my life. All the things that I could do wouldn't allow me to go and give in and, and quit on, on little things. It's, I see this now so much in, in parents that tell their kids that they're spoiled. Or they tell their kid, like, oh, th this one's a party animal, or this one's bad at math. But we make that, we confirm that in, in, in our youth, in each other, by focusing on these things. That power of our focus is so critical and so important to be able to go and change and, and start focusing on things that we can control, that we can change. You have been hit with challenges this year, major challenges. I've been hit with change in leadership after a conversation that I had this morning with uh, Jeff Higginson 
I know some of the adversity that you've faced and what he's going to go and share later on. I'll tell you that it's many of you, the expectation and the goals that he's going to share with you, you're going to sit there and think, this is completely impossible. And you know what? You might think, this is totally crazy. Having that worthwhile goal, what he's going to go and issue and challenge to you, you have to decide how you're going to go and take it and respond and react to it. To go and believe that what you want out of that is possible. What you want out of your business, your life, and so many things, it's your choice. Again, there's things that you can't control and there's things that you can. When I was growing up, all I wanted to do was have other kids look at me as totally normal. My grandmother used to go and teach me so many powerful lessons in just accepting myself by taking me into grocery stores. When I was like four years old, she would set me in the front seat of the cart and she would go up and down the aisles of the grocery stores. And she taught me that if anyone was looking at me or staring, that they felt uncomfortable, just to reach out and shake their hand and tell them, hi, I'm Kyle. She said that once people hear your voice and they see your face, then nothing else will matter. The disability will go and, and fade away. Now that's my first instinct for those of you that I met to go and reach out and shake somebody's hand right away for the first time when I meet somebody. 99% of the time, especially people that, agile people, people that like engage, come back and shake right away. It's uh, funny, 1% of the time though, when I go to shake somebody's hand, I'll go and see their eyes get big, like that look of terror, like, whoa, this guy doesn't have a hand, what do I shake? <laughs> to me. It's, it's my way of showing that, yeah, the seemingly obvious disability might be something that you see, but it's not going to affect my life. It's not going to affect my relationship with you. It's when the kids would come up and ask questions. It's one of the hardest things that I had to endure. The kids would go in and ask, what happened to your arms and legs? I would tell them, that this is the way that I was born. And the kids would keep asking, what happened to your arms and legs? And I'd tell them, this is the way that God made me. And kids want to know the real dirt, so they keep asking questions, keep going for it. And finally, like nine or ten times, kids ask, like, what happened to your arms and legs? And I'll go and tell them, well, like, I got dangled over the tiger cage at the zoo, <laughs> dropped in. <laughs> you see the eyes get big, like, oh, okay, I understand now. I had a, um, when I was 10 years old, the guy came up to me and asked, he was in his like probably 30s, and he said, what happened to your arms and legs? I told him, Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> and he believed me. <laughs> Talk about interesting belief. But because I see the world this way, does not mean that other people are going to see the world the same way when I meet them. So allow, allowing myself to fall into that mode of, of being a victim, being helpless, just because someone else would go and look at me that way, that is not the response that I should choose to have. I am the only one that can decide what I'm capable of. In your life, you are the only one that can choose to believe. 